medicine is an intensely practical subject. You're always trying to decide what to do to people. And it's traditionally been taught as a hands-on subject, as an apprenticeship. You follow the practitioner around and see what the practitioner's doing. So, it's hard to see. So clinical practice traditionally was an apprenticeship. And the practitioner told you what they were doing and why they were doing it. And you learnt on the job. And what they would also do as they were doing it is explain why they were doing the things they did in terms of their beliefs about what we've now called science, their beliefs about how the world works. So if they believed in the four humours, they would talk about balancing these humours in people. If they believed in astrology, they would talk about the influence of the stars. There were all kinds of different ideas about medicine, and the practitioner would tell you what their views were and explain why they were doing what they were doing to that particular patient. So they would describe the case in terms of the beliefs they had about the world, because the idea of medical practice was to change the state of the patient and make the patient better. Now, of course, everybody knows that if you get the science wrong or if the science is incomplete, what you do to your patient may not be what you think you're doing to your patient. And it may make the patient work or it may make worse or it may have nothing to do with the patient. Now, here are some little pictures that I wouldn't have bothered with for you, but come from an old undergraduate course. There is the first emperor of China. His, he wanted to become immortal. And so his doctors gave him mercury to try to make him mortal. Because <laughs> it was full of life. Um, that is somebody during the plague in the Middle Ages. And they thought the plague was caused by the wrath of God. As some people recently think the floods were caused by the wrath of God. Um, so they went around whipping themselves as penance to try to put a stop to the plague. It wasn't the medical practitioners exactly, but for all we know, the medical practitioners might have done that. That's Carlos the Bewitched of Spain, who had this genetic deformation of the jaw, which ran in the whole of his family. They didn't know why. They thought he'd had a spell put on him, so they hunted for witches in the streets. Um, we can now trace the family tree with the gene that caused this. Marie Antoinette had a mild version of it as well. So the things they did were absolutely useless, but people will go for any kind of cure they think they can find, which is why so many of the more doubtful fringe medicines have so many followers these days. Anyway, Medicine gradually did more and more scientific research and it knew it had to do inquiry, it knew it had to push itself forward. And this went on in science for a long time, especially with advances in the 19th century. And then we have the extraordinary fact recently, <laughs> relatively recently, that medicine started talking about evidence-based medicine. Most of us who aren't medics thought it was based on evidence all the time, <laughs> but uh, now they're concerned with medicine-based evidence. And they now tell the students that they've got to keep up to date with yeah. scientific reasoning and they've got to go, keep going back to conferences and things to learn these things. So everybody knows that you've got to get your facts as right as possible and we're pushing further and further and finding things all the time. And, of course, we want to find things all the time because that's where cures lie. That's how we can improve things. But at the same time, this is exactly what has got medicine out of its depth. It doesn't know where it is with all the powers it's got. And this is what I'll try to show. Now, the trouble with knowing an awful lot of facts and knowing how to manipulate the world is that what you know is a series of this is true, therefore if I do this, this will happen. So it's about how you influence things. But on the other hand, 
Knowledge is completely neutral. You can do anything you like with it once you've got it. Knowledge is power, but it's power for doing anything you want. And we have some dreadful stories in the history of medicine. Here is our friend, Mr. Shipman, <laughs> Dr. Shipman, who used his knowledge to not exactly lure in old ladies and kill them, but it was that sort of thing. He was busy. Do you recognize him? Yeah. Yeah. He's Mengele. And there's our Schwitz. And he was a trained doctor. He had exactly the same training as other doctors, but he decided to put it to a different use. So, obviously, it's not enough for medicine to know an awful lot of facts and to find out more. There's obviously a lot of question about what you do with those facts. Now, some people say it's obvious. You just have to do good. The thing that makes a doctor a doctor is not just knowledge of the skills, but doing the right things with it. So a lot of people will say, well, it's just a matter of doing no harm, or it's just a matter of following the Hippocratic Oath. Um, has any of you ever read the Hippocratic Oath, the original one? <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, what, happens, what happened was, if you're going to present yourself as an expert to the public, you want to say not only what skills you've got, but something about what uses your group puts those skills to. And Hippocrates' lot have, were a, a sort of sect, a medical sect, and they had all kinds of aspects of their oath. One of them, interestingly, was that they wouldn't tread on the territory of the surgeons, and they also said they would love their teachers and respect them as if they were their own parents and all sorts of trade secrets and things. So the point is that when you get a certain amount of knowledge, you may get together with other people and put out what modern companies would call their ethical codes, their standards of how they would behave. But of course, they weren't all necessarily the same at all. What you did was put out reassurances to your patients so people would be told that this was the kind of use you would put your knowledge to. And the Hippocratics, among other things, said they would not divulge their patient's secrets. So it's um, that's very much modern confidentiality. That's one thing that has survived. Now, the point is, every single time you make a decision about practice, about doing things, there are necessarily values involved. You're not simply using your knowledge, you're making decisions about what use you're going to put your knowledge to. And values can come in various kinds. They can be completely selfish values. So Shipman's values, I don't know, did he get a kick out of killing these people? I don't know, we don't know, because he hanged himself before we found out. But there could be all kinds of values that people have, and a lot of doctors are accused by largely rival doctors, but other people as well, of working in their own interests. For instance, one of the subjects we're going to be discussing is transplants, and a lot of the transplant surgeons accuse the nephrologists of keeping people on dialysis instead of referring them to transplants because they make a lot of money out of dialysis. So you get accusations like that. Doctors may say, ah, job is to help people, but you never know. Doctors are human. So they may be going by their own selfish values. They may be going by moral values in the very broad sense. Now, the broadest sense of moral values is values which you use, if you're morally conscientious, to control your own actions against your own best interests, if that's what, um, if the two of them conflict. And also, the interesting thing about humans as moral animals is that we will often sacrifice our own interests to make other people conform to our moral values. There seems to be a deep streak of altruism in human nature, so that even if it costs us something to bring a wrongdoer to justice, we're willing to do it. It seems to be part of our social nature. This is increasingly being established by 
moral psychologists and evolutionary psychologists. But the point is, so it isn't just a conflict between moral and selfish. You've also got the conflicts between all kinds of different moral values. The moral values are the ones you're going to have to put out to your patients. It's no good telling your patients you're going to work in your own self-interest. But you might have different moral values that you're putting out to your patients. And a very striking one now is that some doctors are happy to perform abortions and some won't do it at any price because they have different moral views. That's not obviously self-interest. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.